welcome and good morning. Great to see everyone here for this student-focused uh, Q&A with Dr. Allison. I'm Emma Patu. I am the program director of the McMaster MPH program. And just Dr. Allison, to give you a little context about our program and maybe a little bit about um, our department a bit more on the educational side, uh, so our program is a, a generalist uh, MPH program. We admit to about 35 students uh, a year, and we offer a practicum and a thesis track, and approximately 25% or so do research. Um, but we are in the department of HEI, so there are a lot of research intense programs such as health research methodology, um, there's also um, e-health, health policy, um, so really neat interdisciplinary uh, mix of students. Uh, we might have other uh, trainees here. Maybe if students can just put in the, the chat um, what program uh, they're from, that would be great. Okay, so kind of seeding a trend here, health research methods and MPH. Um, fantastic. So that's um, essentially who we have here uh, today. And um, we have MPHA, so our student association, they have kindly helped to uh, put together questions uh, for this session. I have Chizoba. Um, or Lila, who is here today, who will take the lead in, in um, orchestrating that uh, student element. And before we begin, I would like to recognize and acknowledge um, that McMaster operates and learns on the traditional territories of the Mississauga and Haudenosaunee nations and within the lands protected by the dish with one spoon. Uh, wampum, an agreement almost, uh, sorry, amongst all allied nations to peaceably share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. Um, so at this time, I'd like to just uh, outline what this session will kind of look like. Um, but first, I want to thank the Hooker uh, Lecture Planning Committee, MPHA, um, uh, our student organization uh, for uh, supporting uh, this event and making it uh, possible. And so in terms of the format, uh, Dr. Allison, um, I'll just say a few words of your background first, just to set the stage. And then uh, if you can maybe speak about your research career for about 20 minutes or so of your background. Uh, then we'll move to a Q&A session. Um, MPHA members, if you ask questions, if you just maybe want to slightly introduce yourself. So Dr. Allison has an idea of maybe some of your research and interests and to help to um, streamline the conversation. For the other trainees on the line, please feel free to chime in the chat if you have uh, questions uh, as we move along. Uh, so after the sort of the research Q&A, then we'll move to the career related uh, questions. And uh, then uh, we will close from there or maybe have an open question session. Uh, I think these, these um, uh, types of uh, engagements are really nice when sometimes you have a little bit of an unstructured uh, element. And so I'll start here with an introduction of Dr. Allison. So Dr. Allison, has an illustrious uh, academic career. He's a Dean and Distinguished Professor at Indiana University's Bloomington School of Public Health. Um, go Hoosiers. Uh, it seems like you guys are doing really well, yes, um, uh, in, in men's basketball. Um, so I'm reading for you. Uh, Dr. Allison is world renowned for his rigor in research methods and lucid communication of research findings. Um, he has uh, <laughs> won numerous awards, has over 600 uh, pub publications, um, and I think I'll just close with that. I think we can go on for days. 
Uh, but um, at this point, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. Allison so we can learn a bit more about um, him, about him and his research career. Well, thank you. That's very kind of you. So um, I'm going to kind of look at my clock a little bit and see if I actually talk for 20 minutes. That's probably 19 more than anybody really wants to hear me drone on about my career. We'll see if I can be a little briefer than that. Uh, so, you know, where one's career starts is hard to say. And a common question that I get is something like, how did you choose to be a scientist or why did you choose to be a scientist? And I think that it's an interesting question because it presupposes two things. The first is that I know the answer to the question. Um, and, and as a scientist myself, you know, my thought often is we should stop asking people questions that presume that just because they do something or have some characteristic that they know about that, right? So a great, you know, uh, I don't know what, sprinter may not know why he or she is a great sprinter. You can ask them and they might give you a great answer or a great mathematician or a great basketball player. Um, they may not know. Um, the second thing I would say is that it presupposes that I did choose to become a scientist, which as far as I can tell is actually not true. Um, so it is true, I hope, that I'm a scientist, but it's not true that I chose to be a scientist. Um, I feel, rightly or wrongly, very much that it's a calling, um, that it's not a job, it's a vocation. And the word vocation comes from the Latin vocare, meaning to call. And I, I don't mean this in a religious sense, but I just mean it in a, in a sense of experience. I feel that, that I've been called. And I felt that way since I was a kid. In other words, this is who I am. Um, if they didn't pay me to be a scientist, I would pay other people for the chance to be a scientist because that's who I am. Um, when I started as a kid, you know, we'd say, when did you start being a scientist? I think I started as a kid. And, you know, I'd go in the backyard and be left alone by my parents and I'd turn over a rock and there'd be some insect or worm or larval creature underneath that rock. And I would say, how did it get here? Did it crawl under the rock or did it come up through the earth from underneath or did somebody put the rock on top of it? Why is it under the rock? Why doesn't it get squished? what does it eat? Um, that's sort of how it started for me. And along the way, I also found that I had a habit that many adults found very annoying, which is I questioned a lot of things. Um, and many adults still find that very annoying, even though I'm an adult now. Um, and so I would say things like, how do you know? Are you sure? And question. Um, I remember a particularly striking moment, probably in about the third grade, when we learned that every triangle has 180 degrees in it, that a line has 180 degrees. What really explained what a degree is? Somehow it seemed like a degree existed as opposed to was invented. Um, and a student asked the teacher, how do you know that every triangle has 180 degrees? And she said, well, think about it this way. You can unbend a triangle and then you would have a straight line. And you know that a straight line is 180 degrees. So that shows that in every triangle, there's 180 degrees. And I thought you could unbend a circle, but that supposedly has 360 degrees and so on. I thought, this is ridiculous. I was a little bit too nervous to say to the teacher, this is ridiculous. But that was one of you know real uh, points for my career of saying, okay, we got to question everything. And as I said, that doesn't always make you popular as a kid because um, adults don't like to be questioned. But even I found as an adult, it doesn't always make you popular. I've been attacked many times quite vociferously um, in public, sometimes because I question things, because I say, how do you know? Are you sure? or even a little strong, more strongly sometimes, I know you say X is true and we should all believe X is true, but I either think X is false or X is not known to be true. 
And that's not a very popular thing, especially among people who are advocates who want others to believe X is true and thereby say, and let's do something about it. So um, in any case, that's sort of where I started in my career. I went through high school. Uh, late in high school, I found that I wanted to be a psychologist and that meant Hitchcock movies, right? That meant interpreting dreams and so on. And I wrote a, a big paper as a senior in high school on dream interpretation. And at the end of it, I read every book that I could get in the county, any county library in the place where I live, in the county where I live. And I handed it to my professor or teacher. And he said, this is very good, but you need a conclusion section at the end. Who's right? You know, you review these 17 different theorists, all these different books, 49 books or something like that. Who's right? I said, you know, I was wondering that myself. Who is right? And how would I possibly decide that? They just offer these views and I can't figure out who's right. And he said, well, you're an expert now. You read 49 books. Yeah, but still doesn't tell me who's right. That just tells me what they think. Um, and I could tell you what I think, but what makes that right? And so I did my best to say something in the discussion section. But in the that was a real critical point for me to think about evidence. Well, what's the evidence? How do we decide who's right? So I got to then college and soon I still wanted to be a psychologist, but the idea of psychodynamic theory and interpreting dreams, that started to go away. I was thinking about evidence and behavioral, cognitive behavioral treatment and so on. Still wanted to be a clinician, wanted to be a clinical psychologist. Got to grad school eventually. And I start realizing in grad school that while I like doing clinical work and I'm okay at clinical work, I don't love it and I'm not great at it. Whereas when I would write, my professors would say, you write like a scientist. And I started realizing that that's me. And again, questioning everything and having fun. Um, I asked one of my professors once, how do we know which of these theorists about IQ? You're asking us to give these IQ tests to kids in schools. And there are these different theories of IQ. Which one is right? And again, so back to like the dream interpretation, which one's right? And the professor says to me, well, they each think they're right. And I said, well, what evidence do they have? And he said, well, they bring these factor analyses to bear. I said, what's a factor analysis? He says, it's kind of this multivariate technique. I said, I need to understand this because I don't want to take anyone's word for things, right? It's like the, the teacher with the triangle, right? I don't want to take her word for that. Um, I want the Pythagorean proof. And um, so he says, well, then you need to go and study multivariate statistics. I said, okay, how do I do that? He says, sign up for this course and multivariate one. And it wasn't being offered, but multivariate two was being offered. I didn't know the difference. I just said, is this okay? He said, same thing. He said, take it. So I took it. I then realized multivariate one was the prerequisite for multivariate two. So it was kind of a mistake to go to multivariate two first. Uh, but the professor was very patient with me, a guy named Bernie Gorman. He said, don't worry, I'll, I'll catch you up. And he did. He became my senior, my, my uh, dissertation advisor and really a wonderful, wonderful guy. And really taught me a lot about science and thinking about statistics and evidence and how to have fun with it. And so I took that, but that was really part of my not wanting to take anyone's word for it. If I was gonna understand these IQ tests, then I had to study statistics. So I just took then every statistics course I could take in grad school, everyone they had. And soon people started to think I was a statistician and jump forward 10-ish years later, I'm at a visit to UAB and the chair of biostatistics says, we wanna hire you. I wasn't there for a job interview, but he says, we wanna hire you as a professor of biostatistics. And I said, well, I'm not a biostatistician. I said, I'm a psychologist. And he said, no, I've seen your CV. You're a biostatistician. Really? And I said, you know, if you put a piece of chalk in my hand and you say, go to the board and derive the central limit theorem, I can't do it. I said, now, if you say, figure out whether one way of analyzing data does better than another way, teach people how to do it, come up with a creative way of using statistics to analyze data from certain designs that other people haven't figured out how to analyze yet, that I can do. He said, you've just defined biostatistician. 
He said, you're a biostatistician. I said, okay, if you think so. So then I went to UAB as a professor of biostatistics and stuck with it, had a lot of fun, got NIH grants, NSF grants, um, more and more seen as a, a champion of rigor, reproducibility and transparency. Again, that idea of not wanting to take people's word for things, looking at finding mistakes in the literature, uh, trying to get them corrected, trying to hopefully always do it politely. And a lot of that, that picture behind me is a path. And it's, a, it's, a, it's both a metaphor and a reality. It is a literal path that I've been on many times. Uh, and I'd love to take you guys on with me when you visit. Uh, but it's also a metaphorical path. You know, for those of you who know the book, the Tao, the Tao Te Ching by Lao Tzu. Um, the Tao means the path, the way. Um, and part of the way is involving recognizing your ignorance. It involves a little bit of humility. Humility is not something that I that comes easy to me. I was probably not born with a lot of it. Um, uh, but, but what I'm feeling is about humility is that if you become at all active in life, uh, with others, either you start with a good deal of humility, and I admire people who have that, or if you're like me and you don't have a good deal when you start, life will beat it into you. So life has beaten a good deal of humility into me. And I think that that idea of the path, stay on the path of humility, of accepting and acknowledging your own ignorance, of being able to point out other people's ignorance, even when they are unwilling to accept it or acknowledge it or don't realize it, but to try to do so in a civil and polite way. Those are things that are very important to me. Um, I do a lot of work of correcting errors and pointing out errors in the literature, trying to make it better, but I try never to attack a person. I will attack a paper, I will attack an idea, I will attack a data set, but I will try not to attack a person. And I think as we have that field, this field rising up ever more of people promoting rigor, reproducibility and transparency, um, I think having ways of doing it, almost a Geneva Convention, you might say, of stay on the path, stay on the good path of pursuit of truth, absolutely, uncompromisingly, stay on the path, but not in attacking others, trying to do it in a way that's constructive and good-spirited for all. So I've probably talked a little less than 20 minutes, but longer than I should have. I'll stop at this point, and I'll be glad to take the conversation where you want. very much, Dr. Allison. So um, we would like to now move on to our Q&A session. And we invite um, other students who are a part of the chat to please uh, raise your virtual hand and ask a question or even type your question in the chat box. So we'll start off with our first question and we're gonna start in the research category. So our first question will be um, by Hannah from MPH. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Dr. Allison, um, for that. That was really interesting. Uh, thank you for your lectures um, earlier this week as well. Um, so like Chizoba said, my name's Hannah. I'm also from the MPHA. I'm in the MPH program, and I'm interested in epidemiological research and uh, knowledge translation. Um, so I have a question about the narrative review that you collaborated on. Um, where you provided a guide for guarding against exaggerated effectiveness claims in childhood obesity intervention studies. So I was just wondering how you think your work can be used to support the creation of scientific research with greater rigor and more sound reporting practices um, in other fields. There's no single way that that occurs, uh, but I'm glad you noticed the paper and it supports uh, a hypothesis that I will offer here. Uh, and I emphasize that I don't have evidence to show this is true. But I think that there are many different ways in which um, speaking and writing and, and published papers in particular can have a great impact. And we often use that, or we try to measure that impact by citation counts. And I do think I use them myself and sometimes my faculty like that and sometimes they don't when I'm evaluating them for things like, among other things, tenure, promotion, hiring, raises, and so on. There's a lot of controversy around those. I do think they're good, but I also think they're incomplete. So I think there's certain kinds of things that 
um, if, for example, you, you develop a method for a radioimmunoassay or something, people are going to cite that whenever they use your radioimmunoassay and say, this is the method I used. There are other things that kind of raise people's consciousness that may not then get cited. And the paper you, you mentioned is an example of that. Uh, the feedback we've gotten sort of conversationally or uh, in cyberspace is that that's been an extremely impactful paper. Now, I don't know if that will be reflected in its citation count because it's not offering a specific method or a specific finding. It's more of a consciousness raising. And so we'll see. But I do think these kinds of consciousness raising papers are really important. And I have received much feedback from many people that the work many people do, including but not limited to us, that involves calling out errors, that involves pointing out places where things could be more rigorous are having an impact. And my subjective sense is that's occurring. We're trying to then see if we can create some objective data on this, um, not just about my own work, but just about the field of how much more rigorous is the field getting over time, if it is getting more rigorous over time. But I think these consciousness raising papers do help. Awesome, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Allison. So we'll now move on to our next question by Delvere. Hi, I'm Delvere. My research interests are in women's health and reproductive health. Um, and I am also on the MPJ. So my question is, obesity being contagious is one way to explain how social networks may influence one's lifestyle. But do you see this concept as beneficial if applied as a framework to base individual decision making off of or harmful? Do you think that being framed as contagion may make people accept their reality and hinder any intervention to prevent obesity? So I think that as with most things, the answer is it's complicated. I think we need to distinguish from contagion as in social contagion versus contagion as in biological, uh, true pathogen contagion. We need to distinguish between where we are now given our current state of knowledge about contagion versus where we might be if we develop additional knowledge about it. And I think we need to distinguish about the different effects of these beliefs as on, for example, uh, control of weight versus stigma. So I think the social contagion idea is an important one, but I think we need much more research to understand how big it is. The work by Christakis and Fowler, which initially introduced the idea of social contagion, to my knowledge, in the field of obesity has been very, very heavily criticized by Russ Lyons, who's a professor at my university, so a conflict of interest or disclosure or what have you there, uh, and perhaps some others as well. That doesn't mean Christakis and Fowlers are wrong, um, but we should be aware that those criticisms exist. And I don't think we should yet be confident that there is a large social contagion effect, though I think it's very plausible that there is. With respect to uh, biological contagion, there are things like adenovirus 36, which we think may lead to obesity. There are other infectious diseases that may, and it's important to follow those up as well. I think some of those can reduce stigma. Some can increase stigma, right? If I think that, you know, someone may sneeze on me and give me obesity, maybe I don't want to be near them and that stigmatizes them. On the other hand, thinking that it's not all volitional may reduce stigma. With respect to the idea that this may reduce the drive to reduce one's own obesity. This is frequently said about things that uh, imply some, some physical or biological other than purely behavioral effect on obesity. And I think that those things are kinds of uh, full of logical fallacies, right? It assumes that in fact, if it's not behavioral, it's not stigmatizable, it can't be controlled. And if it is behavioral, it can be controlled. And behavioral is not biological. Um, it assumes that even if I thought it was 
biological, then I wouldn't want to reduce my obesity enough. And that if I thought it was behavioral, I would reduce it. I think most obese people don't want to be obese. And if we actually delivered safe and effective and implementable and available methods to not be obese or be less obese to them, they would be glad to, as uh, someone once said, if we built a better mousetrap, they would beat a path to our door. So I don't think we need to worry about people not being motivated. I think people are very motivated. Just need to give them better tools. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allison. And thank you, Delvia, for your question. Next, we'll move on to Kiara. Hi. So, yeah, as Chizova mentioned, my name is Kiara, and um, I'm also part of the MPHA. Um, and my research interests include um, chronic disease prevention and epidemiology and biostatistics. Um, so I just had a question about how in your research, you often mention how um, an increase in BMI is often associated with decrease in quality of life and pain. Um, so in the concept of uh, longevity and possibly introducing palliative care near the end of life, I was just curious to know if you have any examples of where research has informed the practice of palliative care and how this care could be adjusted based on a person's BMI or any comorbidities that they may have. Interesting. So um, there is very substantial research on palliative care in general. I'm not an expert on it, but people like Atul Gawande and many others um, have spent their careers on it. There's a great deal of work there. With respect to palliative care and obesity toward end of life, I don't offhand know of any research. I'm guessing there may be some, but I just, I'm not aware of it. In terms of palliative care throughout life, I think it, as one defines palliative care as making people's lives better in ways other than weight loss, then I think there is a great deal going on. And it ranges from the pure medical things that we don't often think of as palliative care, but giving people statins and anti-diabetic drugs and so on to help them reduce the negative effects of their obesity and leave better, happier, healthier, more comfortable lives to using exercise. Because as Steve Blair, who's a, an alumnus of my school, another disclosure, um, long before I became the dean, uh, shows even if one is obese, um, being physically fit and or exercising still leads to better outcomes, even if one doesn't lose weight. That doesn't mean one wouldn't be better off still if one lost weight, but exercise can be very helpful. There's the health at any size movement, which says emotionally and socially, we can accept ourselves and each other at any weight and should accept ourselves and each other as good people and good human beings, irrespective of weight. That doesn't mean one wouldn't be a necessarily a healthier human being if one were not obese, but one is still a valuable, worthy uh, human being, a human being worthy of respect, even if one is obese. And those are all ways of providing palliative care, you might say. Thank you. Thank you, Kara, for your question, and thank you, Dr. Allison. Um, we have a question from the audience, so I'm going to invite Becky to please ask a question. Hi there, Dr. Allison. Thank you for um, some great presentations this week and this opportunity to ask you questions today. Um, I'm a PhD, a first-year PhD student in the Health Research Methodology Program. And first, I wanted to say I loved your comment about how important it is to uh, be respectful with everyone you work with and how important humility is. And I can also say I'm also that person who asks a thousand questions, and I have to be careful of when I ask these questions because people I work with have in the past been pretty irritated with my constant questioning around the evidence. Um, so um, I've worked in public health nutrition and maternal and child health um, as a registered dietitian for about 20 years. And I just wanted to know what your thoughts were about um, nutrition standards that we have been advocating for in schools and daycares, for example, about like how many grams of fiber in a cracker or how many grams of fat in yogurt, for example, um, and how effective you think that might be or the utility of that 
Um, given your comment about how nutrition in general, the evidence behind nutrition in general is pretty weak. And so I just wondered if you could just reflect on that, uh, even in an obesity prevention uh, frame, please. Sure. I think that it is important that we give nutrition recommendations in the applied setting. I think it is important that we are honest when we give those recommendations that we do not state that they are more strongly supported by evidence than they are. Yes. Uh, I think it's okay to be silent, by the way, on evidence, depending on your content, right? So if I were the director of a suite of preschools and I said, I recommend that everybody eat this because they'll get more fiber. And I think that's good. I don't feel I need to make an evidence statement about that. I, that's not mm. necessarily my job in, in that role. Right. I need to say, don't run in the hallway if you're carrying scissors. That's my opinion. <laughs> and, and eat these crackers. And that's my opinion. And that's okay. But if I am going to make a statement about evidence, if I say, because the evidence shows that eating these crackers will make you healthier or something, then I do think I need to be very honest about the strength of that evidence. So that's real important. Right. Um, I also think it's okay to make recommendations sometimes in the absence of knowledge that they will be helpful. I think it's okay to make recommendations under the belief that they might be helpful. Hmm. I think it's even okay to say, I have very low confidence that this will be helpful, but I still think it's important to come out and say it. So sometimes I might say, I'm gonna tell all the kids that they shouldn't run with scissors in their hands. So I think it's really important that I say that. I then think there are a lot of them are going to run with scissors in their hands anyway. But I think it was important that I came out up front and said, don't run with scissors in your hands. And that can be important for lots of reasons. It can be important for legal liability. Okay, I said it. Well, you know, don't sue me as the superintendent of this preschool. Uh, it can be important for showing that I care and saying, you know, I know I couldn't prevent it, but I, I did care. Um, it may be important because I may not statistically be able to show, maybe one kid won't run with scissors and will not get hurt. So there are lots of reasons to do things. And I think there are many, many things we do in the absence of evidence. And that's perfectly okay, right? right. I buy my wife a Valentine's Day gift every year. There are no randomized controlled trials that I know of that says you should buy your spouse a Valentine's Day gift every year. But my recommendation to any newlywed couple is you should do this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so we don't have evidence for everything we do in life. But as a scientist, what I do not do is come out and say, I am a scientist. And as a scientist, you should believe me that it is vital to buy your spouse a gift on every Valentine's Day. Right. That would be disingenuous. That is what many do in the field of nutrition. They say, I am a scientist. I have specialized knowledge. You should listen to me because I am a scientist. And you must do this. This is very important. We know this. And that's disingenuous. And that undermines the entire field of science and our credibility. Because then people say, you flip flop. And in fact, the evidence isn't there. Yeah. And we shoot ourselves in the foot in the long run. Right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you very much. Uh, your use of analogies makes everything very clear. So thank you. And um, we also encourage other students to please ask questions uh, if you have any. So we'll move on now to Rachel and her question. Yeah, hi, Dr. Allison. Thanks for this great conversation. Um, yeah, my name is Rachel. I'm also a first year MPH student. Um, so within public health, my personal interests lie most strongly in health equity, social determinants and harm reduction. So uh, just my question here, uh, you mentioned in one of your articles that obesity related policy proposals often spark heated debate and you kind of go on to discuss the relevance methods and standards of evidence that are used to make policy decisions regarding obesity. Um, so my question for you is from a public health perspective, what type of evidence do you think is required to fuel population level change in obesity rates through policy? while recognizing that obesity is a very complex disease that has many social, biological, and environmental causes. Sure. I don't think any evidence at all is needed to implement policies or advocate for policies 
for anything. Um, I think it can be useful, but it's not required, right? The idea of what a policy should be or what we should do is not a scientific judgment. The idea that we should have, that we must have evidence-based policies is nonsense. I believe we should have evidence-informed decision-making in life, but not evidence-based. There are many things we do in life, back to my Valentine's Day example, or you could have your belief in God. How much evidence do you have to have to have a belief in God? Zero. It's called faith, right? You can decide what you believe or don't believe, or, or you can, whether you decide or not, you can just believe or not believe. There's no requirement that you have evidence. There's no requirement that you have evidence to buy your spouse a Valentine's Day gift. Um, and there's no requirement that you have evidence of any particular strength to recommend more fiber or less fiber or more saturated fat or less saturated fat. You just be honest about the standard of evidence. Now, different organizations that then have powers and beliefs may have different rules about evidence. So for example, if we go into a legal setting in the criminal context in the United States court system, the standard of evidence to convict somebody is beyond a reasonable doubt. So there, if I'm a scientist opining in a legal case, now there is a standard of evidence. May get a little fuzzy of exactly what's reasonable doubt, whose doubt, what I judge as reasonable doubt may not be the same as you. But you've got a concept there. There has to be some evidence. And if I'm coming in as a scientific expert witness, I'm gonna talk about this idea of reasonable doubt, right? So think about DNA cases and so on. So there's a standard of evidence. Now in a civil case in the United States, standard is not reasonable doubt, it's preponderance of evidence, which generally the courts interpret to be more, re more reasonable than not. And they try to then sometimes be mathematically and it gets very confusing if you're not a Bayesian. If you're a Bayesian, maybe you can do it. If you're not a Bayesian, they say, well, like doctor, 51% of the evidence or 51% belief or 51% probable that this is true versus not true, right? So if we say, does this, did this drug or does this drug in general cause heart attacks and we're looking at wrongful death suits, then we have a standard of evidence. There needs to be science, needs to be good science judged by the standards of the courts. And it needs to make it more likely than not that this proposition is true, that for example, this drug causes heart attacks. If we go to the FDA for drug approval, we have a very clear standard of evidence in the United States. Benefits must outweigh risks. Now, how we balance benefits against risks, again, gets subjective, but we have clear standards, and then we have clear standards of evidence for how we demonstrate benefits, and it's randomized controlled trials. Anything other than a randomized controlled trial, almost never acceptable in the case of approval of, of pharmaceuticals. We go to the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, for making statements in the public about this is known to be true. It's back to randomized controlled trials in most cases. So it's gonna depend on the situation, right? But if you're just saying to me, you're the superintendent of a school district, how much evidence do you need to remove sugar sweetened beverages from vending machines and put apples in? I don't need any evidence at all. I just need to believe it's a good idea. That's a really inter interesting answer. Thank you. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Dr. Allison. And now we'll move on to Hillary. Hi, Dr. Allison. Thank you so much for this very interesting talk. Um, as Shadova said, my name is Hillary, and my interest in public health uh, currently, it could change, obviously, are in health promotion. Um, and my question to you today, so has there been any recent shift in the rigor of obesity research? And then do you have any advice for young researchers interested in obesity to increase the rigor of this research? With respect to the first question, the answer is I don't know. I am not aware that there is a sufficiently rigorous, robust, general assessment of the rigor of obesity research over time that we can point to and say, it's clearly getting better, it's clearly getting worse or no change or what have you. Uh, I'm part of a National Academy of Sciences Council, strategic council that 
is looking at rigor reproducibility and transparency in science and other aspects of the scientific endeavor and how to promote betterment of science itself and trust in science. And we'll be looking at those things in science broadly, um, not just in obesity. But I think that's something that as a field we need to start working on. My subjective sense is that science in general is more rigorous today than it has ever been. Um, there are some areas where it's less rigorous, but in general, it's more rigorous than it's ever been. Uh, but we still have a long way to go. With respect to what can uh, early career scientists do to make their own science and the science of obesity research in general more rigorous, I think one is to um, hold themselves and lead to the highest standards of evidence and lead by example. And I think often early career people and young people are often the most powerful when they introduce new techniques into their collaborations with more senior, more influential, more well-known, more powerful people. So if you're in the lab of a very, very senior scientist, or you collaborate with a very, very senior scientist who's very influential, that senior scientist may not know how to do some of the new techniques that you may more easily embrace. They may not embrace the culture you more easily embrace of pre-registration or of double checking with a second statistician, all um, analyses or of publicly posting data. But if you go to the senior scientists and say, you know, for this project that you asked me to be the first author on, I'd like to publicly deposit the data after we publish. And I know most people in our lab, we haven't done that much, but let's try it. Can I try it? And if that's senior science, yes, let's do it. You lead the way. You may have a double benefit. You benefit in that paper, you benefit in your own career, but you're also benefiting that senior scientist to start to do it in his or her lab. And that senior scientist clout may start to lead by example, again, the whole field. So those are some things you can do. That's great. Thank you so much. Sure. Thank you, Hillary, and thank you, Dr. Allison. Um, we see that Emma has a question. So Emma, please go ahead. Yes, thank you, Dr. Allison. I have a question around like given, you know, in public health, research is obviously a very important component. And I wonder, you know, for for someone that like you that's very well established in, in the field of nutrition and obesity research, and it's very contentious at, at some points where um, there are a lot of federal actors, um, you know, private entities that try and spin research to fit their agendas. Where do you feel that your role kind of stops as researcher? And do you feel that you need to be advocate sometimes? I think one is always entitled to be an advocate whenever one wishes. But I think it's just important to separate your advocacy role from your role as a scientist. And in some cases, potentially a professional role. Right, so if, for example, I'm a professor or a dean or a, a staff scientist at FDA or uh, an NIH Institute director or a journal editor, those are all roles in which I have some fiduciary responsibility to the person who's given me that role or the, or the organization, right? So in my role as dean at IU, I need to act in a way that is commensurate with the role of Dean at IU. And I need to fulfill the mission of IU and do what I took the, position, the job on to do. Now, as David Allison, as an individual, I have my First Amendment rights, freedom of speech in the United States. I have my academic freedom rights in the academic community. And some of those are given to me also by IU, the academic freedom part. Um, but it's important to separate those out. So there are times when I speak as David Allison, and that's okay. There are times when I speak as the Dean of the School of Public Health, and that's okay. And it's important that I separate them, right? The other thing is there are times when I speak as a scientist, and there are times when I speak as an advocate. So if somebody says to me, do you think we should do this? There are some times when I wanna say, yeah, I think that's a good idea, but that's maybe different than the science. 
And then there are times when I speak as a scientist and then I think I need to stick to the data. So it's perfectly fine, I think, for any of us to say, I think we should fund this program on nutrition in the schools, or we should fund that thing or that thing. For example, I think it would be great if we had more funding for bariatric surgery that allowed more obese persons to get the benefits of bariatric surgery. But that's my belief as a human being, right? That's not a scientific statement. It's informed by my knowledge as a scientist. But if I wanna say that, I should say, that's my belief as a human being with certain values and so on. And I would advocate that. As a scientist, I can tell you this is the evidence about bariatric surgery. This is the evidence of how much it costs. This is the evidence of its benefits. This is the evidence of its risks. This is the evidence of how many people want it. This is the evidence of how, of how many people are willing to accept it and so on. That's the science part. The part where I say we should make it more available to more people and somehow find a way to fund it. That's advocacy. That's my opinion. That's not just science. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Dr. Allison. We have another question um, from Sandy. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Allison. Uh, just really amazing talk and, and, and thought provoking. So, um, um, like you really make it um, very distinct, our own scientific, maybe knowledge based opinions as opposed to evidence. But I'm wondering more of the like, and when you, when you talked about writing the conclusions early on in your life, um, when we go to publications, and then sometimes um, what happens is that the, the reviewers, they want that kind of um, evidence, even if your conclusions from the data is um, just contributing or validating some science. So this dilemma of uh, publications of validation studies, or when you're saying, well, the paper is showing this, but also showing that, and I don't have a concrete answer. So um, um, I, I re I'd really appreciate your opinion on that. So I'm not sure I understand it. Let me, let me say, say what I think the, the, your concern is back to you. I think what you're saying is there are situations, one of which, you know, I'm generalizing a little bit, but there are situations, one of which is when you're trying to publish a paper in a peer reviewed journal in which another party is providing some request and or pressure to you to say things that you don't think you should say? Mm. And how do you deal with that dilemma? Uh, or in general, when from the experience of submitting papers, when your conclusions are not as direct or as um, um, novel as, as wished in the field, then your papers get rejected because, well, uh, you're not giving me a final conclusion or you're not um, um, novel enough. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's take a few analogies. Somebody said they liked analogies before. So I think here, here's the first analogy. Somebody comes to you and they say, um, you know, if you just go into the bank and you say, may I withdraw some money from my account, at most you will get a small amount of money unless you're Bill Gates or something. But if you go in with a gun, you are more likely to get a large amount of money. I now face a dilemma. Should I go in with a gun and rob the bank or just have to settle for much less money? This doesn't sound like a moral dilemma. This just sounds like an inconvenience. I wish I had more money, but I don't. And I have to accept that. Um, another analogy is somebody is saying to me, go do this bad thing. I really like you to go beat that person up. They're bothering me. I don't like, them. go beat them up. And my response is, uh, how do you feel about no? No. Well, if you don't do it, I'm gonna be angry at you or I'm not gonna give you the reward. I said, I guess I'll have to accept that I don't get everything in life. There's a path behind me. Stay on the path, right? You don't always get rewarded for doing what's right. A moral dilemma is when you are faced with two different ethical imperatives or ethical 
issues, ethical motivations that compete, right? So for example, suppose you had a uh, person and they had some horrible health condition and by not telling them the complete truth about it, you might make them feel better. And you, have, you feel like you have a duty to beneficence. On the other hand, you feel you have a duty to truth and autonomy. So that's a moral dilemma, okay? If you say, this, paper, this journal won't publish my paper unless I distort the evidence, that's not a moral dilemma. That's just a pain in the neck. That's like saying, the bank won't give me more money than I have in my account unless I hold up a gun to them. Don't do it. Yep. Yeah, thank you. I understand that moral aspect, and we we stick to our rigor. But uh, maybe more on the other side, from public, like from reviewers and editors, what can be done that, especially in the field of nutrition epidemiology, that it is accepted that a paper um, based on on the science and, and the data that shows it still could get published, even if it doesn't, it's not uh, novel or it's not saying the conclusion. Now you're talking. Okay. <laughs> so my view is that. And again, this hypothesis, I don't, I can't prove this, but my view is that the subset of people that probably have the nearest, the most in reach short term, short term achievable, near term achievable power to affect change are journal editors. I think they have the most immediate powerful levers. I think funders have a lot of power deans, chairs, individual faculty, journalists, many others. But I think the ones who have the most immediate levers are the, are the journal editors. Um, I think they hold the keys to something that is highly desired. And I think it is built into their already accepted role, accepted in principle, not in practice, that they are the gatekeepers or should be the gatekeepers of a certain degree of rigor and truthfulness. And I think if we can apply, we as the scientific community can apply a combination of support and pressure to journal editors to radically up their game, I think we can have a big impact. And so I think we need to say they're people too, right? They respond to incentives and, and carrots and sticks and tools and rules. I think they need support. Most journal editors, um, are not trained to be journal editors. Many are confused and ignorant about these things. They're trained as physiologists or chemists or statisticians or mathematicians or physicians or nutrition scientists. They're not trained as publishing experts and they need help with this. They don't have enough staff to deal with this. So we can't just expect them to do everything, but if we can give them some tools and then the others, we, they do need they do need to grow a spine as a group, right? I'm sure I've offended many people with that statement and that's okay, I'll keep making it. There are journal editors who have spines, who do great work, but not enough. And I think we need to say to more journal editors in a constructive way, grow a spine, find your conscience and act accordingly. And I think you and all of us as scientists need to be part of that to provide polite, constructive, but consistent, positive pressure to journal letters that says, there's a mistake there. You haven't corrected it yet in your journal. You need to fix it. It's the right thing to do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sandy. That was a great question. And thank you, Dr. Allison. Now we'll move on to a question from Tegwendi. Hi, um, thanks for introducing me to us. I'm also part of MPH. Can you speak a little more loudly or closer to your microphone? Ooh. Um, do I sound better now? Much better. Perfect. So I was saying thank you for introducing me, Chizoba. Uh, so my name is Teg Wendy. I'm also part of MPHA. My research interests are in maternal and pediatric health and quality improvement. And my question is in one of your papers, um, you reported a difference in 
trends in terms of increased waist circumferences among adolescents with racial and ethnic backgrounds compared to the reported um, trend of weight stabilization in the US. And in terms of bridging research and practice, would making pediatric health more culturally informed have a greater impact in supporting these adolescents' health over, um, I guess, uniform medical best practice? Sure. I think it was um, Max Planck, but I'm not sure. Might have been Popper, who said, science is the art of systematic oversimplification. And it's in some sense, it's what's the level of simplification that works for you, right? So if somebody were to say to me, can you describe the people on this, in this Zoom meeting, assuming I had infinite knowledge about each of you, I guess I'd say, well, in principle, I suppose I can. And so I could start with each person and describe everything I knew about them. Um, and would that really be useful? It might in some contexts. Uh, on the other hand, it might be useful to say, well, there are students in program A and there are students in program B. And the students in program A tend to have these characteristics and the students in program B tend to have these characteristics. And that might work. And somebody would say, but hold it. Even within program A, you know, there are some who have been in the program a little while and some a long while. And there are some who think this and some who think that. The same thing in B, there's heterogeneity. And I'd say, you're, you know, you're right. Let's, let's break it down by which year they're in. And that might suffice. And we could keep going until eventually we got back to the individual and described them. And where's the right answer? Depends what you want to do. So that's where personalized medicine comes in. We always do personalized medicine, right? Since the dawn of time, since the dawn of medicine. Simplistic example is if people have hypertension, we tend to give them antihypertensive treatments. If people don't have hypertension, we don't give them antihypertensive treatments. That's personalized. Now, it's a very crude level of personalization. You might say, yeah, but what about their genotype and their race and their age and their sex and their BMI? That's a more sophisticated level of personalization. So, yes, we eventually want to drill down more, but what's the right depth of drilling down will depend on the context. If, again, back to that example, if I'm the superintendent of a school district, and my question is, what, if anything, should I have vending machines in my school at all? And if so, what, if anything, should I have in those vending machines? And how should I price them? I'm going to probably make a decision for everybody at once. I'm going to try to make the choice that's, that I think is best for the average person. In contrast, if I'm a healthcare provider advising an individual patient, I'm gonna be much more nuanced, but even there, there are gonna be limits to how nuanced I can be. we will have to take that one at a time. Um, could I just extend a little bit more on sure. my question? I think um, relating it to a paper that I had read, they had reported that when considering race in terms of health outcomes, that it, more so was had to do with individuals' experiences of racism rather than like the actual particulars of the race or culture. So I think I I was wondering more so if you felt this was more a cultural thing or if there might have been more alternative factors involved with the difference in trends. I'm unclear when you say is this a cultural thing? What is this? So the increase in waste trends, I and waist circumference trends, I think it was in East Asians and one other group. Um, I can't entirely remember from the paper, but if the overall reported period of weight stabilization had kind of prioritized data from white adolescents, then I'm just wondering if the reported like increased waist circumference among these specific like diverse groups, if you believe that in terms of transferring to medical practice, if there would be any value because it would have cultural background or if it might be more influenced by experiences such as racism. Did that come out a little clearer? <laughs> so is, the question is, is the 
increase in obesity or waist circumference among subgroups potentially a function of racism toward those groups? Yeah, or other stressors, yes. Plausibly. Um, I cannot definitively say it is, but it's certainly plausible. We do know that um, psychosocial factors can affect weight and physiology. That's well documented uh, in many, uh, there are certainly associations and it's also well documented in experimental evidence all the way down to animal models that psychosocial and interpersonal, inter, uh, conspecific uh, interactions do affect physiology. We've published a paper that chronic social subordination in mice um, seems to lead to earlier death in um, about as rigorous an experimental design as you can get. It's, it's hard to assign people or animals to social subordination. You can assign them to circumstances that promote social subordination. Um, you can't assign them to the social subordination itself. But when we do that, bad things happen in longevity. I think some of the most compelling evidence I've ever seen in this is from um, Professor James Collins at uh, Northwestern University. And he's a neonatologist and he studies low infant birth weight and infant mortality and provides fascinating evidence on racial differences that it's all correlational. So again, cause and effect, it's hard to separate, but make a very compelling argument in my mind that many of the racial differences in this country in terms of low birth weight and infant mortality are due to the experience of racism. Thank you. Thank you to Glendy and thank you, Dr. Allison. That was a really interesting question. Um, so right now we, this is the end of our research questions. So I wanted to invite other students, if you have any research related questions, please ask them. And if not, we are ready to move on to our career related questions. Okay, so it seems like we don't have any um, uh, right now. So I'm going to, pass it along to Dalvir first to ask her career related question. So Zoba, I just have one um, research kind of related question. Um, I'm just curious to know, you know, every researcher kind of has their rituals when they're gonna approach a study, build a model. Um, maybe we can take a regression model, for example. I would just love to hear, like given your expertise, Dr. Allison, how do you set up uh, a study uh, like what is what are what are some things that the key elements that you're looking for, um, key messages that you would really want to let students know? Like obviously, you know they're taking research methods courses, regression courses, but just to you know, based on your experience, what are some of these typical errors that early career professionals make when they're approaching model building? Well. I think that one always has to ask what are one's goals? And so both in the choice of research question and then the choice of how one pursues the research question is important to say, what are the goals? There are lots of reasons to do research and lots of different questions. So are you doing the research because you really want to get your name in newspapers and make a big splash because it feels good or makes your mom know why she paid for graduate school? Um, that's okay, you know. Um, is it because you want to advance knowledge? Is it because you need a grant? And if you don't get a grant, you won't get a job or tenure. It's important to sort of think through why you're doing the research, um, is it to have fun. So there's lots of different reasons to do research. And I would sort of think about that up front. Um, then I would think about what's the question. And now once I've picked the research, What's the question and what am I trying to learn? And always, regardless of whether it's because I wanna make my mom happy when she sees my name in the paper, or I wanna have fun, or I want to reduce suffering 
in the human population from such and such disease, or I want to get a job, I, I need to stay on the path. All right, the path is the pursuit of truth. That can't be compromised. So we need to do that. And then I need to say, what's the way that I'm going to pursue truth for the question I've chosen? And I think there, I want to say is, what's the method that's most likely to give me the best approximation to the truth about the state of nature, about whatever it is I'm studying, and then try to work that through. If at all possible, call your shot in advance, meaning say up front, I'm gonna analyze the data this way, say it publicly, timestamp it, and then do it. Now, after that, what I will say is, my colleagues and I invariably either change or supplement what we do because we never seem to be able to call our shot absolutely 100% in advance, right? You don't know until the data come in that, well, there's a funny outlier there. What are you going to do about that? Or after the data come in, you start to get concerned that there's measurement error. Or after you start collecting data, there's a pandemic and you have to end your study early. Or um, after the data come in, you find out how much missing data there are and you do something differently. So it may never be perfect, but try as best to call a shot in advance. And then what I always say is just be honest with the reader. Rigor is compromisable. It's perfectly reasonable. In some cases, you know, no studies, there's no such thing as rigorous, non-rigorous. It's a matter of degree. There's no study that's perfectly rigorous. It's perfectly okay, in my view, to do research that's not so rigorous. What's not okay is to not tell people that it's not so rigorous. That's not compromisable, right? The, the truthful transmission of what you did is not compromisable. But if you wanna say, you know, I know I said up front that I analyzed the data this way, but now I've got some other ideas. What we usually say in our group is, try to stick as close as possible to the preset plan. Say it was the preset plan. That's the primary analysis, and we'll definitely do it. And that goes in the paper. And then after that, we're going to analyze the heck out of these data. And if it's of interest to us, we're going to do men and women separately and old and young and different ethnic groups separately. And we're going to try transformations and different missing data procedures and so on and so on. And then we're going to tell the reader those were post hoc and that we analyze the heck out of the data. And then the reader can make their own decision about those analyses. Does that help? Yeah, very helpful. It just, it sounds like transparency is definitely a theme I'm hearing um, and, and sticking with the initial aims of, of the study. Thank you. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Dr. Allison. So now we'll move on to our career-related questions. So thank you very much for all of your answers um, during the research-related questions, Dr. Allison. First, we have a question from Delvere. I have a simpler question, and that is, what has been your greatest aha moment in your career so far? Wow. I'll give you two because I think they've really been very different. I think one is a kind of more fun science, cross science, deep thinking aha moment. And one is a more social, political, career aha moment and is not so nice. The, I'll start on the not so nice one so we end on a positive one. The not so nice one is I learned at a certain point how incredibly ruthless and vitriolic and unscrupulous many of our colleagues are and can be. Um, I knew people would disagree. I knew people would be aggressive. I knew people could gossip. I knew people could sometimes say things in not nice ways. I had no clue that if somebody disagreed with you on a scientific point or found your scientific point threatening to an advocacy position they wanted to advance, the degree of underhanded tactics some people in academia would use. That blew my mind. Um, it was naive on my part. 
Uh, and so I've gone from being a little bit naive in that, or maybe a lot naive in that regard, to being somebody who isn't paranoid by accident, but is paranoid by purpose and intent now. And so I think some of my advice to early career people in that regard is to say, if you want to do stuff that matters, if you are going to talk publicly about things that other people feel strongly about, you need to be prepared for this. And you need to understand that not all of your colleagues will behave reasonably. Most will, right? They may say some not so nice things about you behind your back. They may even say a snarky comment about you in Twitter or whatever, but not hard. But there are a subset who will do things to undermine you and hurt you and take you out of the game that go beyond any reasonable standards of human behavior. Get ready. So that's the not so nice part. What's the nice part? Kind of a fun part. And this is a little bit more mathematical. I've always been impressed by the sort of beauty of science. And it's one of the things I love about science. And my, to me, perhaps the greatest example of the beauty in science and science math thinking is Euler's equation. And to see it seemingly pop out of nowhere after you, you conceive imaginary numbers, and then you start to work the trigonometry of the unit circle with imaginary numbers. And suddenly Euler's equation pops out. That like, that beauty blows me away. That beauty of Darwin at one point saying, I do not know, I have not observed a moth with a proboscis X long, but I'm almost certain there is a moth with a proboscis that long because there is a flower that has its pollen at a depth of that length that is generally pollinated by moths through their proboscises. And there must be a moth with a proboscis that long. And then later, someone finds it, and that's the pollinator of that. That's, to me, those things are beautiful. It's sort of these simple kind of mathematical things. It's just, I predict it's there. That's how it works. It's got to be there. It's Newton's universal law of gravitation. Those beautiful mathematical functions. And then there's the reality of biology. And it's not so beautiful all the time. We want to make it so. And so I think we get a lot of debates about what is the cause of obesity, if that, even, that question even has meaning. What is the cause of the obesity pandemic, et cetera. And then I think we need to say, does that not presuppose that there is a primary cause? Is there any reason to believe there's a simple answer? What is the diet that's right? What is the factor that's driving it? And maybe the answer is these are mathematically inelegant. And over in the field of evolutionary biology, where we have a little bit of mathematical development that's a little stronger than the mathematical development we have in obesity these days, there's, there's something called the queen of questions. And the queen of questions is, why do we, and I use we very, very broadly here, I don't mean we on this call, I don't even mean we humans, I mean we organisms that we produce, why do we have sex so much? And no one knows the answer to this, right? As individuals, we might know the answer. But as species, why do so many species engage in sexual reproduction? When from an evolutionary fitness point of view, it seems so much more efficient to engage in asexual reproduction, right? If you are a Daphnia, for example, which can engage in both sexual and asexual reproduction, why not always do asexual reproduction and reproduce many more of your genes? There must be some evolutionary fitness, or we think there must be, to sexual reproduction. But working the math out is hard. And people have proposed things, Muller's ratchet, the Red Queen hypothesis, and nothing seems to work mathematically. And the consensus, the tentative consensus view right now is that what may work is no one beautiful, elegant thing. The Red Queen hypothesis is beautiful and elegant. It comes from Alice in Wonderland. And it's the idea that 
Alice and the Red Queen and weren't running, but they're not getting anywhere. Alice looks at the Red Queen and she says, we don't seem to be getting anywhere. Where I come from, if you run fast, you get somewhere. And the Red Queen says, here, you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in place. The Red Queen hypothesis is we run as fast as we can to keep up with the pathogens, the microbes in our body who evolve faster than we do. And because we can't evolve as fast as they do, we reset the immunologic clocks, uh, locks with sexual reproduction by combining our DNA with others. So that's the Red Queen hypothesis. And it seems like that alone doesn't work. And Muller's ratchet alone doesn't work. And no other thing anyone's proposed really works. But if you put them all together, they might work. And it's incredibly ugly and mathematical to do that. And so that insight may be that for many complicated questions, like what's the best diet, if there is a best diet, like what has been the cause of the obesity pandemic, what will make the obesity pandemic or population obesity levels go down, that it may be incredibly inelegant exam answers. It may be a little of this and a little of that. Thank you. Thank you, um, Dalvia, for your question. And thank you, Dr. Allison. Um, the hypothesis was very interesting. I've never heard it before. So next we'll take a question from Rachel. Yeah, hi, Dr. Allison. Um, I'm just curious, what do you wish you knew before starting your career in research? I think that probably two things. Again, I'll stick with the social and then the scientific. Um, with respect to the social, it it's sort of a variant of what I said before, which is, I think I, I wish I knew that essentially when one acted at a certain level and, may, and spoke at a certain level where one's words had impact on what people thought and did, that one en had entered the field of politics, whether one liked it or not. You could think I'm just a scientist and I'm just here and I'm just making a statement about what is the evidence that X causes Y or that X is bigger than Y or that X is getting larger over time and I'm just acting as a scientist. But somebody once said, if you have two people in a room, you have a relationship. If you have three people in a room, you have politics. As soon as you get out in public and you make a statement that more than one or two people care about, you've entered politics. And I think that at a social level, I wish I understood that early in my career and I would have been prepared for the, the first, I now get attacked regularly and I don't like it, but I'm prepared for it. The first time I got attacked, it hit me like a howitzer out of nowhere. And I would have handled it a lot better if I understood that I was in politics. So that's, that's the thing I wish I'd understood. Um, scientifically, I think it's a much more nuanced thing. I think I wish I had maybe better understanding of the relative value of different questions, that not every scientific question is equally valuable, right? Some are trivial and uninteresting. Some are really interesting, but scientifically or practically trivial. Uh, some are both scientifically interesting and practically important. And I wish I had a little bit of a better understanding of that, um, but that's okay. It was fun learning it, I'm still learning it. Uh, I don't really regret not knowing it as much as saying, I didn't get that in the very earliest part of my career. I got that a little bit later in my career and probably would have launched a little bit earlier if I understood that earlier, but I've enjoyed learning it. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Rachel, and thank you, Dr. Allison. So next we have another question from Devendi. Oh, my question's kind of just general um, and about how you maintain a habit of learning outside of your main interests while being fully engaged in research and other professional roles. Thank you for asking that because that's one of my favorite aspects of our careers. You know, uh, faculty members, including me, uh, we like to whine and complain sometimes. And usually the things we whine and complain about, we're right to whine and complain about them. But I think we often miss the forest for the trees when we do that. 
So yes, I whine and complain about all the forms I have to fill out and all the silly continuing education classes I have to check the boxes on and how many redundant things I have to do uh, and so on and so on. But you know what a lot of my job is? A lot of my job is doing this, what we're doing right now, talking to incredibly bright, energized, interested students and other faculty members. A lot of my job is going on hikes with students and postdocs and faculty members and while I'm on hikes saying, what do you think? And talking about books and ideas and saying, what does it mean when we say that we know this? What a privilege, what an incredible privilege to get paid to do that. So yes, I have to fill out some forms and it's really annoying. Yes, I get criticized sometimes and it's really annoying. Yes, I have to take some certain continuing education things and it's really annoying. But I get paid to read books and then write my ideas down and talk to students and that's fantastic. So how do I do that? I just love it. And to me, that's the idea of calling. It's a calling. I love learning and I love learning from others. My grandfather told me once, you can learn something from everybody. So I'm always learning from my students. I learn from my postdocs. I learn from my fellow faculty. I learn from my professors, colleagues. And I think this idea of work-life balance is the biggest piece of BS that's ever been sold to a cohort and a generation of scientists. And I would forget about it. If you're thinking about work-life balance as a scientist, I'm not talking about as a researcher. I'm talking about as a scientist. I think you missed the point. Researcher could just be a job, right? Southwest Air, maybe Southwest is a bad example because they don't serve food. United Airlines could hire you as a researcher to do some research to project how many people are gonna to wanna to order chicken sandwiches versus beef sandwiches versus vegetarian sandwiches in the next five years so that they think about their plans. That's research, it's not really science. Right? And if you do that and that's just a job to you, that's fine. If you do science, you wanna understand the state of nature. That's a calling. And we don't separate it, right? We don't say to, an artist at dinner, when the artist says, oh, the beauty of Michelangelo's work, let me talk about it. We don't say, hey, hey, it's dinner time. Leave that at the office. Separate this work and life. That's the beauty of that artist's life. We don't say to the musician, don't play any music after five o'clock. Don't be ridiculous. We don't say to the priest, don't make a blessing at dinner, Put the, leave that at the office. As scientists, it's a call. So when do I do this? Always. When I go for walks by myself, I listen on my iPhone to a reader reading journal articles and audiobooks to me. On the weekend, I go for a hike virtually every weekend and my students and my postdocs come and we talk about books. Yeah, sometimes we talk about gossip. Sometimes we talk about what we want to have for lunch. But we talk about books and ideas and evidence and epistemology and statistics and so forth. When um, we go to dinner, we talk about that. So it's always, and I think it's important to read very broadly. So I read evolutionary biology and I read books about the history of science. And I think, well, how did... Galileo think this through. And, you know, I don't really understand enough physics to really understand Einstein, but I read a little bit. How did Einstein come to that? And I try to understand the way he might have thought and how that might affect me. And I read books about physics and mathematics and um, food technology and um, nutrition and exercise physiology and try to put it all together. And so I think just keep reading very, very broadly. Read, listen, talk, repeat. Don't forget the listen part, right? Get critical feedback. 
So when you throw your ideas back out, someone says, I read this book and I think this, that's a ping. Wait for the feedback to come from the ping. Right? Wait for the other person to say, I think you're wrong. Okay? And we hate to be told we're wrong. Gordon Allport in his book on dogmatism once said, this is not an exact quotation, but something like, the greatest conflict of interest is that we hate to be told we're wrong. I hate to be told I'm wrong. I hate it when people disagree with me. But it's vital that we expose ourselves to that. Right? So send the pings out. So I think this. And then wait for the circumstances. Set up the circumstances for people to come back and disagree. Don't surround yourself by yes people. Don't intimidate your students so much that they won't disagree with you. When your students disagree with you, if they disagree rudely, say, that's rude and inappropriate. You should show me respect. But if they disagree politely, thank you. I bow to my student. Thank you for disagreeing with me. I may not agree with you. That's okay. Show them it's good to disagree. Open your mind. Have fun. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allison. That was a great response. I actually have a question myself. So um, for those who are interested in pursuing a career in research, do you have any advice on navigating feelings associated with imposter syndrome? And what measures would you take to overcome this mental block when it does come? So I'm not sure I'm the best person to answer that. Um, there's probably a reason I chose, even though I'm a licensed clinical psychologist, I chose not to do clinical work. But I think there are probably people better than me. There are different ways of dealing with things and no one way. It's back to sort of like the mathematical, the inelegant, no simple mathematical, beautiful form for everything. Probably no one answer. I think stoicism is a very effective strategy in life that I think in modern culture in the US, I don't think we talk about enough. And I think stoicism is very important, but it's insufficient. So it is a way, it is a tool in the toolbox. That's one I'm good at. That's one I often advocate. You put in, in blunt terms, it's get over it, right? So I feel insecure all the time. Um, I travel in circles intentionally where there are a lot of people who are more powerful, smarter, and more accomplished than me. And um, sometimes I say things and they say, I disagree with you. And then I feel uncomfortable. And what I say to myself is get over it. Put your game face on, get in the game, get back in the game. Don't go home and cry, get over it. So I think that's a lot of it is just do it. We all feel insecure sometimes. Put your game face on and get over it. Now, that's one tool in the toolbox. There are other people who might say, well, are there ways to be calm enough so that when I try to put my game face on, I'm more successful? I remember one person, sorry, someone very close to me, um, who had been a, a star student all their lives until they got out of the, um, the elite academia and went into the real workforce. And then in the real workforce, suddenly they weren't achieving very well. And they went and talked to a peer who had their same demographic characteristics that were underrepresented in that organization and said, I'm struggling, you know, I'm not getting good evaluations. People don't think I'm in the game. But the person said, you don't talk enough. You come to the meetings and you're too quiet. And this person said, but I'm not an expert in that. You know, why should I run my mouth when I don't know the answer? And the person said, look at the other guys around the table who've been there longer and are successful. They run their mouths. Whether they know the answer or not, they run their mouths. So, so what you need to do is run your mouth. The person said, but I don't. I don't wanna just say stupid stuff that's unsupported. And I'm nervous too. I don't know what to say. So the person said, 
before you get in the room, you know what some of the topics are. Go do your homework and come with a question prepared or a thing you're going to say, no matter what. So if somebody points to you and say, what do you think? You say, I've got you in your minds, I've got something ready to say. There's interesting research. I think I'm trying to remember who said this. It might have been Dan Ariely in one of his books. I'm not sure. Anyway, one of the, uh, oh no, I think it was uh, Daniel Gilbert in his book, Stumbling on Happiness, perhaps. And he says, there's research showing that when you put people around a table, you just kind of randomly assign them to tables, and then you give them some math questions to work on. And you say, form a group and come up with, you know, uh, the answers and pick a leader to do this. Who gets picked as the leader? And you might think, well, they should all ask who's got the most, most math training and pick that person or something. But the person they tend to pick is the person who spoke first. Victory belongs to he or she who comes to the table and opens their mouth. So there are a lot of different ways to deal with this, but recognizing, hey, I just got to get there in the game. I got to be there. I got to have a comment prepared. I've got to say something. That's important. If you're early in your career and you work on topic X, right? If you work on omega-3 fatty acids and your mentor was the top person in the world on omega-3 fatty acids, people are going to wonder, is that your work or his or her work? And if you suffer from imposter syndrome, it's going to make it worse. So what do you need to do? You need to find your voice. Look to the lectures of David Hayes Bautista, H-A-Y-E-S hyphen B-A-U-T-I-S-T-A. An amazing speaker, distinguished professor from UCLA. And that phrase, finding your voice, and he gives talks to young people about in academia, how to find your voice and how he found his voice. Listen to his talks, find your voice, even if your voice is tremulous with fear. When you're at the next conference, get to the microphone and let them hear how smart you are, not your mentor, right? Because when it's your paper, they don't know if it's you or your mentor. But when it's you standing at the microphone or you at the dinner table saying, well, I just read this paper last night and I think this. Oh, you think you have a voice. Yeah, if I may, just to quickly follow up, I think that's a fantastic uh, response. It's it's almost like you're building this muscle, right, to position yourself to be strong in the future, in, in a sense. And I think, you know, there's many philosophies, many approaches, uh, but I think stoicism definitely is very helpful in academia because, you know, there's many situations where you're submitting research papers you know, you're getting critical feedback from peers and folks that don't know how much time you spent, you know, on the work. And um, I think that's really important. So yeah, I think about that Amori Fati, right? Sort of be that lover of fate and continue um, and take that one step and then the next. Thank you, Emma. And thank you, um, Dr. Allison. That was really um, touching. Thank you very much. So oh, we have another question from Sandy. Sandy, please go ahead. Yeah, uh, just a quick question, Dr. Allison. I know like at this stage of your career, you, you found that calling, but I was wondering, especially that you had your clinical uh, psychology education, if you, along the path you felt some doubts or regretting, oh, I'm leaving something behind and uh, I, I'm not, I might not um, get it back. Definitely. So when I was getting ready, I was near finishing my PhD and thinking about what's next. And again, I was getting a clinical PhD in a very, quote, professional clinical program, right? They, they taught you in the program I took. There are exceptions, right? My doctoral mentor was great. My master's mentor was great. But in general, they taught you to sit up straight, wear a tie, wear good shoes, say, you know, yes, doctor, go to your internship look professional, have neat handwriting on your reports. The idea of big thinking, no. So I didn't have this real training in science. I didn't have the mentors to sort of 
they, I had people who could train me in the concepts of science, but not the career path. And yet I knew that that's what I was starting to get to now, but didn't quite know where it was going or how to do it. And I start getting job offers and some of them are more clinical. And this was, you know, I think this is 19, probably yeah, 1990-ish. And the high paying one is $45,000 a year. And they would make me this first, I'd be the first person they'd give this particular fellowship to at a clinical site who wasn't an MD. And they said, it's half clinical and half research. And I had enough concept to say, that's BS. You know, I know what's going to happen when I really get in there. The patient's going to be there right there today. The patient's going to need to be seen today. The report's going to need to be filed today. I can always put my manuscript off or my grant proposal off to later. It won't really be 50-50. It'll be 85 clinical and 15. Um, and, but I would make decent money and I could stay in the New York area, which is where I lived and like to live. And so that was one. Or I could go out to, I went out to Parsons, Kansas, which was the first time I'd ever been there. I got off the plane, is all pre-9-11, right? Um, I get off the plane and my mentor, and I'm coming from Manhattan and, or New York. This is Parsons, Kansas. The person who would be my mentor is on the tarmac as I get off this town. Like, Dave, over here, man, right? Like me and six people get off the plane and everybody in that town was his brother or his former student or his former mentor or his cousin. And it was like one big happy family. And I so wanted to be in that family. And he would have given me $25,000 a year, a little more research oriented. It was so flat out there. You could see the curvature of the earth if you looked out on the highway. You knew the earth was round in Parsons, Kansas. In New York, you can't tell. But in Parsons, Kansas, you can tell. And then I got an offer at Hopkins. And that one was $17,000 a year. And I did my math on it. And I just said, I can't, it's not possible. If I get a flat tire, I'm broke. I'm out of business. And so I begged and bargained and bargained. And I got them to give me $19,000 a year as my salary. And I took that. So I took the lowest paying job. But in doing so, it was really hard. And I was going to take the research route. And I said to this friend of mine, he's my peer. He since his guy's name is uh, Vincent Alfonso. He went on to become the dean at Gonzaga. Gonzaga, excuse me, and uh, very young, but wise. And I said, you know, Vin, I said, I don't know. Um, if I go this route, I can go this clinical route. I can even go more clinical than this. I'll make more money. And you know, there are a lot of clinicians, clinical psychologists driving around Long Island where we are, have Mercedes, you know, I wouldn't mind having a Mercedes. Um, and there was a guy, a clinical psychologist said to me, yeah, yeah, that's what you want to do. He said, you think this science stuff is fun now? You know, you're 27 years old or whatever it is. You think it's fun now? He said, five years from now, all you're going to want is a Mercedes in a hot tub. Get out of that nonsense. Go and do this and you can make some money. My dad was a real smart guy. And all of his friends were lawyers and doctors and business people. And my dad chose to be a high school math teacher because that's what he loved. And he loved that lifestyle and he loved teaching. And he made much, much less money than all that. And I think it always bothered him. It always bothered him that it would be really hard for him to buy a Mercedes. But most of his friends had Mercedes. Right? And he was smarter than they were. And he knew it. And it bugged him. And I said, I don't know. I don't know if I want to be like that. But on the other hand, I don't know if I want to go and get a Mercedes and then go to conferences and listen to people give talks and go, I'm as smart as that person. I could be giving that talk. I could be answering that scientific question. I could be studying that and trying to figure this out. And my friend Vin, who is wiser than me, not, maybe not smarter, but wiser, still wiser. And he said, you're looking for the path with no regrets. Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist. Pick a path not necessarily mutable. Some are more mutable than others. 
it's probably easier to go the academia route and then change to industry, government, private sector, make money. It's harder to go the other way. It's not impossible, but harder. Um, so I think, think about that. And there was this moment when I said, you know what? I like to make a decent living, but as long as I make a decent living, I don't care if all my friends drive Mercedes and I don't. And I will tell you right now, I drive a 1996 Chevy Silverado. I love it. I can afford a Mercedes if I want. I don't, care. <laughs> I don't need a Mercedes. When I was a postdoc, I got in line at a dinner buffet with one of my cousins. My cousin, I hope he's listening to this. My cousin was the father of the bride. I went to the wedding, it's a New Jersey wedding. And I get in line, it's black tie. And I've got cufflinks on, you know, like diamond studs. My cousin gets next to me. He's a little bit older than me. He's got diamond studs. And this wedding is like, you know, this could feed a country for, and he looks at my studs and I'm a postdoc at Hopkins making $19,000 a year. And he says to me, are those real? I'm like, are you kidding? I make $19,000 a year. Of course they're not real. Right, I'd probably pay $25 for them or whatever the heck. He says, he points to his, he says, you see these? I said, yeah, 25 Gs. And my first thought is, okay, you win. My second thought is, what a jerk. I can't believe you paid $25,000 for these stupid rocks on your cufflinks. And you think you won. What a waste. What you could have done with $25,000, you could have put a student through school. You could have started a scholarship. You could have vaccinated kids around the world. You could have done a research project. How ridiculous. And I just thought it was like that moment. I thought, I don't care. And then you go to academia and most people don't drive Mercedes and have diamond cufflinks for 25 Gs. And you decide what's important to you. You pick your path. Thank you very much. That's uh, inspirational, really. I am uh, I am a postdoc and a pharmacist by training, so that's really that's close to heart. Thank you. Thank you. That was very inspirational to hear, Dr. Allison. And thank you, Sandy, for that really insightful question. And we have our last question now, and this will be um, given by Dalvir. Uh, so I was wondering, for those of us interested in research careers, what fields of research do you see growing over the next few years? Oh, I think there are many. Um, cybersecurity, going to be big. Um, science communication. Uh, so this is closely related to, but not the same as cybersecurity, um, is uh, how do we combat misinformation? And so for all of you who are studying evidence, that misinformation can be political, national security type stuff. And that misinformation can be about diet and nutrition. How do we help ourselves, each other, the general public, news reporters, et cetera, et cetera work on distinguishing truth from falsehood, known from unknown, reasonably proven from hypothesis and conjecture. I think the science of how to communicate about science is going to be very important. I think a third thing, infectious disease control, very clearly that is big now, it will continue to be big. I think geroscience is going to be huge. It's growing rapidly. How do we live not just longer lives, but how do we live better lives as we get older, socially, uh, physically. How do we live so that ideally until the end, we have independence, we have comfort, we have happiness, we have function. So that we don't live to be 150 years old, but all in horrible states of decline, but rather we live to however long we live, but we live in good health to the end or in good, in good, condition, I will say. I think 
the, as somebody else brought up, I think it was, um, uh, I'm looking for her name here. I'm, I don't see her. Oh, uh, to Gwendy. To Gwendy brought up is marrying social justice and discrimination and stigma and racism to health. How do we connect the dots on those three things in a better way so that we improve quality and quantity of life and health for everybody, taking into account the deleterious effects of injustice and stigma? I could go on and on, personalized medicine and so on, uh, promotion of rigor itself in science. Those are some examples. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dalvir. Um, I received a message that we do have one more question and this question is from Omotala. Yeah, okay, thank you, Dr. Allison. I have a follow-up question to that response about the direction of science towards evidence, communication, and how there's a big possibility of that being in the future. So what are your thoughts around machine learning and artificial intelligence and its impact on research and researchers. Do these things stand as a threat to us? I don't see it as a, a, a major threat. I, I do think there are concerns about it, as I think there are concerns with everything. So you invent the car, vehicle collisions and pollution are concerns. You eat food, food waste is a concern. Anything you do, right? The model of the ecologist is you cannot do one thing, right? As soon as you do one thing, you have inadvertently done many things and everything has concerns, including artificial intelligence. But overall, do I see it as a big threat? No. Um, I think artificial intelligence is a lot like personalized medicine in the sense that we've actually had it for a long time. Um, it's a matter of labeling, but what we have is very primitive and it'll be a long time before artificial intelligence is anywhere near the hype that it achieves now. So I think we need to keep working on it. It's important, but I think uh, it is way overhyped right now. I think it's a tool. I think for the area of science communication can be a valuable tool. I do think we need more and more to be able to analyze um, spoken and written word. We've gotten pretty good at developing software that can turn spoken word into written word. So that's good. Now we need to, develop software that better can digest written word to extract meaning or other things out of it in the way that a human would, so that we don't have to say to a postdoc, go read 5,000 papers and tell me what percent of them did or didn't do this, or we can turn a machine on to do it. Right now, not really clear we can do that. So natural language processing, I think we need big, big advances in to really make it useful. Um, then there are the issues of bias. Uh, that's, that's a hot topic now. And the bias range from conceptually simple things, like if I put a, a meter on my skin and it's telling me about my energy expenditure, or my glucose level, or my movements, and my skin is darker or lighter, how does that affect the reading? That's a conceptually simple thing. May or may not be technologically simple, I don't know, but conceptually it's simple to much more complicated questions, like what does it mean to be fair and biased, fair or unbiased? And the compass data is a great example of that, where you've got an algorithm that predicts recidivism among potential, uh, among people who are in prison who are being considered for parole. And if you analyze the data by one standard, you say, are the, are the error rates different across race, the answer is yes, they are. And so people say, aha, different error rates, that means bias. And someone else says, I analyze the data to look at whether the predictive function has the same correlation with the outcome across race, and it does. So it's unbiased. Hold on a second, what do you mean? How could it be unbiased and biased at exactly the same time? And you could show mathematically that in fact, if those are your two definitions of bias, not only can be, under certain circumstances, it has to be. It's a mathematical necessity. And as soon as you realize that, 
you realize that either there is no single answer to the question of is something biased or unbiased, or that the choice, if there's a single answer, it involves a subjective choice of what you, how you define bias. Yeah. Thank you, Clarissa. No easy answers. Thank you, Omotola, and thank you, Dr. Allison. So that wraps up the end of our Q&A session. And um, I think I can speak for everyone that your wisdom was just amazing today and all of your answers have been so informative. And we really do appreciate the time that you took to um, answer all these questions. Well, I thank you. It is indeed a privilege to be here. And as I have said, my grandfather told me you can learn something from everybody. And Suzuki, a famous Zen master said, sometimes the teacher bows to the student. So thank you for spending your time with me. Uh, Dr. Allison, I just wanted to say another thank you for this engaging and personal um, conversation today and the rigorous lectures throughout the week. Um, at a time where misinformation and skewed values are so ubiquitous, your message about honesty, truth, humility, and science and practice is so important. Uh, thank you so much for bringing this across. Also, thanks to the planning committees and everyone for uh, attending uh, this lecture. So my final words is just to say, in Dr. Allison's words, I hope everyone stays on their path. Thank you, everybody. Be well.